Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Nine Lives, episode 10, with me, your loving host, Cassia. Thank you for the love and feedback on last week's episode. I am so happy you guys enjoyed hearing me recount my stories of Zion um, and also give some tips and insight into my own personal alcohol-free journey. I think um, it was interesting to hear that a lot of you were also sober curious. Um, We put a poll up and 95% of people who voted said that they were sober curious. So It's really interesting to see how many people are leaning towards that lifestyle and are curious as literally as the phrase says, you know, I think it's a good thing to be curious and it's a good thing to ask questions and kind of think about things you want to change in your life. And that's why I love the expression sober curious, uh, maybe instead of alcohol free, because you're just testing it out. You're just trying it like with everything. If you go into something making it all or nothing or black and white, uh, it's going to be a lot easier to fail. But if you're just curious and playful and, you know, if you just say, hey, I'm just going to try, it doesn't matter what the outcome is. But, you know, the point of it is that I'm going to try. That's such a lovely way of looking at things that also feel very serious. Um, Alcohol does feel very serious and fitness does feel very serious. So allowing it to be just like curious Uh, playful, you know, it makes it so much easier to uh, embed it into your routines. So uh, speaking of routines, (laughs) that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, In the Q&A last week, people said that they would like to hear a little bit more about uh, self-care routines, some nutrition stuff, and just in general, some, yeah, just some good routine nuggets, things that I've learned on my on my fitness journey. This week I wanted to talk about a couple of different things. We're going to be a little bit more science-y, but as always we're going to tell some stories. A lot of people, when they're standing at the bottom of this mountain and they're asking for help or they've reached out to me or someone else and they're saying, you know, where do I begin? Like, I don't know how to start this. I have an inkling of something I'd like to try, but it seems completely formidable the idea of losing weight or gaining muscle or whatever the journey is starting running starting lifting and I think you know losing weight or my weight loss journey it was obviously all about losing things right but I think it's nice to sort of reflect on things that you've gained or things that I've gained reframing that whole journey through a positive lens and think about things that people gain from these lifestyle changes and through a commitment to yourself because that's what this is it's a commitment to yourself and the secret of your future is hidden in your daily routines that's something that a lot of people and I touched on it last week a little bit about that sort of every morning we have a chance to try again and every 24 hours is a new day and you know all of that but really and truly the secret of your future is hidden in your daily routines because you, it's like brushing your teeth. You may not notice it the first three days that you do it, but over time, uh, over the next weeks and months, it's going to add up and you'll look back and, and you won't believe how far you've come. A recent example is me trying to become a faster runner. At the beginning of this journey, I thought there's no way in hell that I would be able to get fast. Um, probably to the middle of it, I was thinking there's no way I'm going to get fast. And now I can look back and look at all of the runs that I didn't want to do, all the threshold training I didn't want to do. And I can confidently say, I am faster. Am I fast? Jury's out. But I am faster than I was when I started this process. And the secret of that was in my daily routine. And it got me thinking a little bit about my old routine versus my new routine and some things that I have gained. So if we look at the lifestyle I was living before, and I'm going to give you... (laughs) kind of two abstract examples of like black and white how it was before and how it is now and then we're going to delve into a little bit of science. My old routine was a lot of late nights, late mornings, no movement, no regard for nutrition, all or nothing mentality which led to binging, drinking alcohol every day, smoking cigarettes, uh, excessive consumption of social media and other meaningless media, overspending online for temporary dopamine Negative self-talk, I'm worthless, I'm unlovable, I can't change, I can't do this. All 
compounded into a negative, all-consuming, toxic cycle. Now, if we look at my routine now, which is my new routine, daily movement, walking in nature, being in nature, resistance training, trail running, races, balanced diet, focusing on health, but no foods are off limits, got rid of the all or nothing mentality, quit smoking completely, um, early nights, early mornings, which <laughs> recently have not been, <laughs> have been struggling to get out of bed. But I would say the median 60% of my lifestyle is early, early nights, early mornings. Reading books, drawing, exploring self-improvement and testing the limits of my capabilities mentally and physically. Focused on career growth. And that goes into also cognitive function as well, which we'll touch on. Positive self-talk. I'm capable. I'm strong. I can push for better. I can do this. The cycle has been broken. My days are brighter. I live in hope of better every single day. Now... When we take these two pictures and we put them together, especially for me, I'm like, wow, that's very different. That's so, so different. There is obviously this huge canyon in between um, of like, okay, how, <laughs> you know? And really and truly, I think a lot of these big journeys and these sort of like before and after things that you see on social media, all of those people will tell you that it starts with baby steps. It starts with changing something small that you can realistically stick to and grow from there. The smallest change can make the biggest difference in your life. And this feeds into the three R's of habit formation, uh, which is a really lovely way of kind of looking at like, okay, what are these baby steps and what is something small? How does that then stick? So if you're going to look at creating habits for yourself, the three R's are one is reminder, cue or trigger that starts the habit. For example, traffic light turns green. So that would be like a trigger you know you know that the car has to go right number two is routine the action you take the habit itself example you drive through the intersection number three is reward the benefit you gain from doing the habit example you get closer to your destination if the reward is positive you'll have a desire to repeat the action the next time a reminder pops up eventually this repetition will form a new habit so those are the three r's of habit formation and I can tell you sometimes that positive reinforcement doesn't exist and that's when it gets really hard, but that's when we rely on discipline, which we have delved into so many times on this podcast. But once you realize that, that habits form the trampoline in which your life is springing off, you are your habits, you are your daily routines. And in your mind, knowing that you've got this cycle of reminder, routine, reward, reminder, routine, reward is such a lovely way of looking at things you can do for self-care and to better yourself. Like it's time to go to the gym. You know, your alarm goes off. It's like 6 a.m. OK, it's time to lift. Reminder, got to go to the gym. Routine. So doing the actual thing. The reward would be releasing of happy chemicals in your brain, seeing improvements in your physique, seeing improvements in strength. You then know that with that positive reward, the next time you have that reminder, it's going to be easier to fall into that routine. The same goes for running or for, you know, nutrition, all of these things. It just takes time to ingrain. And that loop, as with all other loops that we've discussed, all cycles we've discussed on this podcast, there will always be steps backwards, there'll always be breaks. But the main thing is that you keep jumping back into that cycle and trying to maintain it as best you can. Um, you know, I've had periods where I've gone 20 steps forward and taking two steps back and I'm actually kind of in that place right now where I'm not feeling 100% myself but in recent years I've taken maybe like 500 steps forward and recently I've maybe taken 10 back and I know if I'm being rational that it doesn't mean I've taken 500 steps steps back it's just a little bit of like a time where I need to rest and recoup and then I can go back back into that cycle, back into the positive habit forming again. If we take my running journey as an example, I didn't go from being out of breath walking down the street to running marathons overnight. I started by joining my mum for walks occasionally in the park, only small at first, but it got me outside and it got me used to moving. Then I set a realistic step goal and started going for daily walks. I noticed huge improvements to my mental health this reward motivated me to keep going. 
When I had lost enough weight to safely begin jogging, I set out every day to my local park and tried to run. Every time I did, I could make it a little bit further, past the next tree, the length of another song. I'd never felt such a feeling of pride in my life. That reward hooked me. I knew I had to keep going with this routine. So I did. Each time push it, pushing further, I made it to 1k finally without stopping and I felt like a damn superhero. A few months after I reached 5k, a year after 10k, and now I can run. Well, who knows how far I can run? We haven't tested that yet and that's the exciting part. All because I, st I stuck to my routine. All because I took that baby step. So routine, reward, progress. Take it slow. Appreciate the journey. It is the best part. I was on a panel last weekend actually talking about this with um you girls will know her uh Sid Sid Grows she has her own podcast go listen Jim Girls Locker Room um but we were talking about you know if if we could go back and do anything differently at the beginning of our journeys or you know what what is it that we love the most about them and you know god if i could go back and do it all again i would because the most beautiful part of a fitness journey wellness journey mental health journey is the first. It's the first walk. It's the first run. It's the first time you start to recognize your features again. It's the first time you, you know, laugh with your mates again. It's the first time you walk into the gym and you pick up a barbell. It's the first time you see definition in your arms. Like it's so cool. What a cool thing. And that is the journey. And, you know, as you go along, it's a never ending road. We're always improving. We're always growing. But the beginning is the most exciting part and I miss it. Like I really miss stumbling about without proper running shoes, with no watch, with not a care in the world, with my corded headphones and my playlist and me and no cameras, no nothing. Like I really miss that part. There was so much innocence and like naive joy about this thing I was discovering for myself and those really are the checkpoints you have to remember to slow down for because anyone will tell you who is like really advanced into their fitness journey that like they miss it and I wish I could go back sometimes so don't look at me or anyone who's like in inverted commas what you would perceive as a finished product to be something that you want to be like be you and be in the now and enjoy that present moment because I'd do anything to go back and do my first 5k again what a morning. I think that was Christmas Eve 2021 or something. And oh, that feeling, it's just amazing. So, I mean, to quote the famous Billy Joel, slow down, you're doing fine. You can't be everything you want to be before your time. I bloody love that song, Vienna. Um, so that leads me on to, we're going to talk about four things I gained on my fitness journey. So we've delved into a little bit about habit forming, how to embed them into your life. But I thought I'd talk a little bit about the nitty gritty of like, what actually happens when you do all this stuff? Because we, you know, sometimes it's really nice to learn about what actually goes on in the body and the mind and, you know, your immune system and everything. Because I, personally, I find that really, really motivating. Um, about halfway through my fitness journey, when I was having like a really, really long plateau, I think it was like six or seven months long, and I was starting to feel a little fatigued and a little bit demotivated. Um, that was the first time that I really started to read books on physiology and neuroscience, um, because I really wanted to learn what's going on in my body. What can I have as a motivator that isn't physical progress? Um things that I know are improving when I'm not seeing a change in the mirror, you know, because so many of us, I think because of Weight Watchers and Slimming World and, you know, the way I, you're probably all my age, but growing up in the nineties and having diet culture shoved down our throat, the way that women are meant to measure progress is by a number on the scale. But the way that I would like to measure progress is how strong I am, my bone density, my cognitive function, my reduced inflammation, my incredible immune system, uh, my ability to run, my ability to live, <laughs> all of these things. That's how I would how I would marker a fitness journey, a successful fitness journey. So we're going to go into a little bit about what those things have been for me and I'm going to teach you what they're doing in your body so that you can feel motivated when you're not, you know, 
seeing results or feeling like you're not seeing results because so much of it, like 90% of it is internal, man. Like we don't, I can't see my nervous system <laughs> um, and I can't see my bone density and I can't see my liver, but I can feel them and I can learn about them. And I can know that like what I'm doing is, is self-care and, and is changing everything about myself internally, um, which will then, as I'll get on to reflect into the, into the outside world. So the biggest thing I noticed during my own journey and alcohol plays a wee bit of a part in this. We, we've spoken about alcohol a lot and I'm not going to go on about it in this episode, but reduced inflammation was one of the biggest things I noticed. Acute inflammation causes flushed skin, pain, tenderness, swelling, heat. Chronic inflammation can be harder to spot. Uh, with a wide range of possible signs. Now, chronic inflammation is something that, you know, that's a medical thing. And if you're dealing with that, that ha always has to be with a doctor. That can't really be targeted by fitness and wellness. But inflammation is basically when something foreign enters your body, like a virus, bacteria, toxic chemicals, or you're injured, your immune system activates. Your immune system sends out cells to trap bacteria and other offending agents or start healing injured tissue. This is the inflammatory response. The result can be pain, swelling, bruising, or redness. But inflammation also affects body systems you can't see. If I'm looking back on like photos and pictures of me during the years that I wasn't living very healthily or with much regard for self-care. You can see in my face and neck, most especially, how inflamed I was. And I remember like <laughs> just basically being unable to recognize my facial features. Especially when I, you look at like photos of me as a wee girl. Granted, I had super curly hair and I'm yet to get that back. One day I will. But, you know, I had a uh, the nose I've got now had these cheeks and eyes like I used to be called Jerry Mouse because of my eyelashes and eyes um, and sort of three or four years into into really the darkest parts of my depression and uh, substance abuse with food and alcohol, whatever, I started to really, really be, be unable to recognize my face. And so did my family. And that resulted in me then caking on more and more makeup, doing lots of other things, wearing wigs, like just putting this mask on because I was trying to get back to me by painting it on. But actually what I needed to do is address what was going on inside so that I could heal that part of myself. And what I didn't realize is that all of the toxins that I was putting into my body, high sugar, there's nothing wrong with sugar, but a very, very high sugar, very processed diet on top of uh, all the alcohol that I was consuming and the fact that I was doing, I mean, zero movement, zero, meant that everything was inflamed. Top that with the cortisol levels of anxiety and stress that I was feeling. I mean, you've got a recipe for disaster. What a lot of people don't realize is that I think when you're trying to hide yourself under layers of trying to fix things, really, really what needs to happen is you need to be looking in internally at things that possibly you aren't doing in your lifestyle. And inflammation in so many ways affects so many people without them knowing. I get very, very inflamed when I'm stressed now. Um, that can be like from down to like my, you know, my what was this called my abdomen to even my arms get inflamed and all around here and it's it's just mental how much uh, a cleaner diet not just blanket clean but cleaner diet water reduction in alcohol and movement can completely transform how you look it it really is wild I think so many people don't realize just how much of a big part that plays in stress management as well. Um, I think because it's very, very widely known that alcohol does obviously inflame us because it dehydrates us. Um, you know, what is going on? And I'm, I'm giving you these facts just because these are genuinely, these are things that I learned and really helped me when I was trying to cut down or trying to change my lifestyle. If I had these in my brain, I then knew the choices I was making and how they were adding up to to help me. So arming yourself with this information is is really, really useful. Chronic inflammation is also associated with alcohol-related medical conditions. Chronic alcohol use impairs not only gut and liver functions, but also multi-organ interactions, leading to persistent 
systemic inflammation, and ultimately, sometimes organ damage. Alcohol does produce inflammation and a little bit more than you think. And this isn't someone who is just a you know casual wine drinker or someone who's just having a gin and tonic once in a while. No, I'm talking about people who are drinking every day, which is what I used to do. And I didn't realize just how much of an adverse effect it was having on the way that I looked um, until it, I, the inflammation started going down and I started to recognize my face again. And I realized like, oh my goodness, that was really quite a lot of swelling. Um, and I do, I remember like I tried everything I would have, I would use gua sha, I would contour, I would do all the, these like microcurrent things trying to get my face back, trying to see my jaw again and see my features. Um, and really all I had to do was cut down on the alcohol move a little bit and eat a kind of all right balanced diet. Um, and I think, you know, this this is not a conversation about all or nothings here at all. This is a conversation about arming you with some science so that when you are making good choices for yourself, you know what they're actually doing to your body. And it's, uh, you know, it can be really empowering to know what's going on and know why the choices we're making are good for us. Because People do rabbit on about, um, this is good for you, you know, eat this, not that. This causes inflammation. And there's so much noise online. And I think in the pursuit of a perfect diet or a perfect anti-inflammatory green juice or whatever, like those don't exist. Everyone's different and needs different things. But also if you just try for like 70 to 80% of your life to be things that are really good for you and are practices of self-care, the other bit can just be fun and that's fine because, you know, we are here to live and enjoy and some some of life's pleasures will inflame us and probably will not be very good for us, but that's absolutely fine, you know? Like, you can't do wellness without fun and I think if you lose that and you lose that spontaneity with your mates or meals out with your parents or you know whatever it is that brings you joy you're gonna you gotta look at life as like yes I want to do things that are good for me and if I'm chronically doing things that are bad for me I'm going to really really shorten my time here and I'm going to make it not very joyful and it's not going to be very nice but if I'm going on a wellness journey I can't cut all of it out because it's not wellness then is it if you're not enjoying yourself the next thing I noticed uh, which was huge mental crazy uh which again dawned on me I think in like 2021 maybe a year into my journey every single year without fail I would have at least three to four maybe five bouts of a really bad cold or flu awful I was always getting stomach bugs rashes um all kinds of like skin infections ear infections throat just like always getting ill and I didn't realize because, well, why, why would I know? But your immune system is so easily compromised by a bad diet or a non-nutritious diet and no movement. I had no idea about the link between movement and your immune system, but researchers have found that performing aerobic exercise at moderate vigorous intensity for less than 60 minutes increases the recruitment of circulation of the immune system's best defense cells, which is crazy. So if we're looking at, at this on a cellular level, which is something I love to think about, my little cells, um, you know, yes, okay, do I do I love running and I want to do two 60-minute runs a week because it, it helps my head and it helps everything? Yes, of course. But on a cellular level, two 60-minute runs a week or two aerobic, you know, exercise a week could change everything about your body, everything about your life. Um, and if you look at the research into it, moderate intensity exercise can stimulate cellular immunity by increasing the circulation of immune cells in your body, which helps your body better prepare for a future infection by detecting it earlier. How cool is that? So literally running can help you fight off colds, can help you fight off infections. And it's something I, I slowly, slowly realized that it was almost like everything was compromised about myself. So when a foreign like virus bacteria or toxic chemicals entered my body my immune system just didn't have the power to push it off so I'd always be written off and I'd have to take time off work or you know I'd miss deadlines and that would stress me out even more because I was just always getting ill and then as soon as well if 
I was getting ill, then I'd always have like a hot toddy whiskey to like make me feel better. Um, and then as soon as I got better, I would just go straight to the pub and then, you know, the cycle continues and you get ill again. And oh my gosh. So it, I've gone like now three or t- two or three winters without having a cold. And of course, like fit people still get colds, of course, but I'm just comparing it. And it's, it's really cool to see just how much you can enhance your own immune system. And then that is your quality of life. No one likes to be sick all the time. No one wants to be in bed with a cold. Like they're really annoying. And I think just knowing that you're building this self that is so like, uh, just strong and resilient is so motivational. Um, knowing that like your cells are strong and healthy and they're there to like fight off all the bad things that are coming along. And yeah, it's just really cool. And sometimes I like back when I was just getting into long distance running, I used to think about that a lot. Like, okay, I know I'm out running. I don't really want to be here, but my cells are really thanking me. So sometimes you just have to think about your cells, but there's no short, there's no shortcut or a secret to success when it comes to building a body that can fight off illness. Um, But the pillars of a strong immune system are healthy amount of sleep, no smoking, minimize sugar, reduce your stress and exercise. And I know, easier said than done, right? Because sometimes you're up late, sometimes you're struggling with a bout of depression and you sleep in. Smoking, hard habit to kick. Definitely. Very difficult. Minimizing sugar in your diet, again, easier said than done. But these are all things that slowly, slowly through those baby steps we talked about uh, earlier and the the cycle of habit formation, these are things that you can implement and you can get there in the end. And I know it seems quite overwhelming, but it's just beautiful to know that all of those things are not just buzzwords. It's not get more sleep, don't smoke, sugar exercise reduce your stress it's those things can quite literally make your body more resilient and make your body healthier and allow you to have better quality of life the other thing that i noticed and probably the biggest thing that i get asked about recently my skin skin is the biggest organ in the body it's it's literally what holds us together (laughs) and it's made of a lot of water but i suffered really bad acne uh, during the time that I was eating really badly and was consuming high processed foods, uh, a lot of alcohol, not a lot of sleep. Um, obviously I was very dehydrated and there was just a lot of infections and my body just wasn't, you know, processing things and it was coming out as acne and I had acne all over my back I had it uh, all down my face I've got videos actually of like me bless me back in lockdown like crying not knowing uh, what to do about my skin and it has got a lot better I do sometimes obviously everyone has breakouts I do get hormonal breakouts those are very very normal Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with spots or having acne and this is just my what I've noticed in my skin and a little bit of the, you know, science behind what goes on. But what I didn't realize is because again, uh, when I, at my old job, I used to spend a lot of my paycheck on gimmicky skincare stuff, whether that was like face creams, treatments, you know, facials, that kind of stuff. I was trying so hard to put a band-aid over a bullet hole when really beautiful skin uh, or good skin whatever you want to call it all skin is beautiful but um, it it starts from nourishing it from within uh, because our older skin cells are constantly being shed and replaced which means a steady supply of nutrients is essential uh, in order to support skin turnover eat the correct balance and you'll feed your skin and help keep it soft supple and blemish free now I will caveat that very generalized statement with obviously everybody has different needs, everybody has different skin, everybody has intolerances. So if you are worried about your skin on a medical level, please, you know, ask for a proper dermatologist to go over like an actual recipe for you. So just a basic overview of things that are quite good for your skin um, are basically what we call superfoods. Um, or what nutritionists would call superfoods and things that certainly were not in my diet before. Um, I think Red Bull and Doritos and vodka probably isn't a superfood, although it would be great if it was. (laughs) Life would be a lot more fun. 
But a couple of really cool things to keep in mind, and these are things that I eat on a daily basis. Uh, Raspberries, they contain red antioxidants, uh, combat free radicals and slow signs of aging. I mean, do they? I mean, they do, but you know. See, I'm still like, sometimes I read this information, I'm like, shut up. (laughs) So listen, like I'm not being... Gwyneth Paltrow here and telling you to top your granola with raspberries every morning you wake up with a glowing complexion Um, because I find that whole blanketing thing rather irksome but it is better to have these sort of foods in your diet rather than not whether that means like you're just sprinkling it on your cereal in the morning instead of having like Cheerios just on their own these are little things that really do add up and uh, I mean I eat berries every day I'm a berry lover i love fruit um and I used to be I mean I used to hate fruit I used to only have it in my cocktails that's the way I liked it so um yeah raspberries amazing citrus is another really really cool uh kind of superfood um again didn't have any kind of citrus in my diet before uh but vitamin c it helps with collagen production um and that's a that's a big thing now citrus you know it's not it's not hard or easy to get in your diet I do it I squeeze it on a lot of my pastas I have it on a lot of our fish um you know I think once your palate changes and and that's another thing this this stuff takes a while to taste nice and I don't hear anyone say this but I'll say it it's really hard to go from a diet of high processed convenient food to then enjoying whole foods No one talks about that bit in between where it tastes like dirt, dude, because it does. And now I'm like, yeah, I love a piece of farm fresh salmon with citrus and like bulgur wheat. But before that would have been, that would have tasted like the earth and disgusting. And I wouldn't have wanted it because going from a diet of like pot noodles with like cheese inside uh, with a side of salt and vinegar crisps, which is so high flavor, high chemical, you know, you're getting so addicted to this sugar and salt and MSG that when someone puts something whole food in front of you, you're not going to want it because you're like, that tastes, doesn't taste like anything. But slowly, 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 once you do begin to cut down or cut out those sort of foods, not that you should uh, never, ever cut them out. I still, I mean, I love a salt and vinegar crisp. You'll never pry them away from me. But, you know, I think slowly you begin to sort of become a little bit more accustomed to those sort of flavors and tastes. And then when you realize how good they make you feel, that's all you really want to eat. Um, I was just discussing this the other day with a friend, but we were uh, driving past McDonald's and we were like, oh, for a laugh, should we go in? Should we go for a drive through? Which I, once a month, you got to, you have to. The Golden Arches. Um, and I think I just had like, I can't even remember what I had. It was like apple pie and fries or something small. Um, and it gave me such a bad headache. I was like, oh, I forgot about the McDonald's headaches. It's just all chemicals. Um, and then it's little moments like that where I would now probably prefer if we could drive a little bit further and pop into a shop where I can get, you know, something a little bit more like a sandwich with crisps. And it's a little bit more, you know, it's going to give me a feeling of energy instead of being hungry five minutes afterwards. Another brilliant food, avocado. Uh, I mean, I know everyone talks about avocado. Uh, like I get it, it's a millennial thing, but the vitamin E in avocado replenishes skin's natural moisture barrier, helps keep you hydrated, all very good things. Walnuts or any foods that are rich in omega-3 fats and B vitamins strengthen your skin cells to lock in moisture. I learned the other day that um, omega-3s and omega, I mean, omegas, if you're not taking an omega supplement, omega supplement, please do. So important for brain function but also so important for the skin cells for their ability to actually hold on to moisture it's it's so important so if you're finding it hard to get those omegas in your diet certainly look at a supplement notice a huge difference i take uh what are they they are the icelandic icelandic omegas um i really like them so recommend those eggs the big dog i know if you're vegan probably not the big dog, but anyway. (laughs) Amino acids help build and repair muscle and skin tissue. Eggs are brilliant, Um, high in protein too. They're wonderful, wonderful food. Uh, Yogurt, okay. I literally exist. (laughs) I love yogurt. I have yogurt like twice, three times a day. 
Um, but yogurt's very, very good at reducing blemishes and breakouts. Again, blanket information, very, very vague. This will not be, you know, true with everyone, but it's just nice little things that you can think about. Oh, I'm going to have yogurt with raspberries and walnuts. Hey, that's cool for my skin. Like it's nice to at least know what these foods are doing instead of just hearing the buzzwords online and being like, okay, I get it. We have to eat whole foods. But um, those are all things that are in my diet every single day. Berries, yogurt, nuts, uh, eggs, things that are whole and good and wholesome for yourself. And, you know, it's taken a while to get my palate to the point where I'm like enjoying it <laughs> and liking what I'm eating, but you will get there. You will. And and this is how human beings, uh, you know, I hate to be all, I don't want to sound preachy about this, but I love an, an, ex, an exercise that I love doing is imagining my ancestors. <laughs> Whether I'm out on a run, I'm lifting weights or I'm eating a plate of food, I love thinking about the ancient Celts. And sometimes I imagine them running between their villages, you know, in only a piece of fur with paint on their face. <laughs> and I get all emotional. But I also think about the foods that they ate and what they had access to you know, before food became commercialized and before food was advertising and money, um, what were they eating? You know, and I know there's a lot of buzz around the caveman diet and all of that, you know, but really, really, if you could make 80% of your diet, things that you find in the earth, things that are not touched by chemicals or super duper processed, you're going to be onto such a winner. Um, and I know there's this huge trend now called biohacking. Don't know if you guys have come across it. Um, which I won't speak on too deeply because people are mental, but aren't people always mental in every part of the internet? But um, <clears throat> biohacking is this whole thing about whole foods and how you can sort of reduce inflammation and uh, reduce illnesses and through foods, whatever. You know, I just, just be, <laughs> please be careful about what you consume online. Make sure it's from an actual dietitian and nu nutritionist. But it, it is an interesting topic and it's something that, I feel very passionately about and actually I, I am trying to get a nutritionist on so that I can discuss this stuff in a forum that is, you know, they can correct me or they can make sure that the information is correct because I really, really don't want to be talking about topics that I'm not qualified to speak about. But, you know, there's just a few tidbits for you there. The next thing I noticed, and it's probably the biggest thing and something I talk, I've touched on but not really delved into too deeply is cognitive function. So main two things being decreased brain fog, uh, decreased brain fog and increased creativity. Um, the brain fog before, I didn't realize just how much I was unable to think <laughs> until now looking back, realizing how uncreative I was and how just bogged down by the fog of it all. I... Yeah, I hardly had any original ideas and I could find it very hard to keep conversations or at least have conversations that were meaningful. I, I, could, I couldn't read. Well, I could, of course I could read, but I found it hard to sit down and concentrate on a book. But not only that, I think the most important part of reading is not the actual action of reading. It is absorbing and then thinking about the book you've read afterwards. Because that's when the thoughts are really percolating around your brain and you're making that your uh, individual experience because everyone reads books, but it's, it's the, it's the takeaway from your life that you can apply in that information that you've now sort of thought about and how you apply it into your world that matters. I'm sure there are some of you listening to the podcast or thousands of you that listen to the podcast that then use the information and go away and, and you think about it. You think about it when you're not listening and that is your brain. You know, that's amazing. That's your cognitive function working. You're feeling creative, you're applying things that you're learning, which is so, so important for our human experience because we are here to experience new things, to learn and to grow. And for so many of us who struggle with uh, addictions, whether that's in food or social media or alcohol, whatever it is, any substance, that it really clouds that creativity. And on the episode about purpose, I spoke a lot about the sort of childlike connection to your purpose and creativity and joy and while that's really important you know knowing that what you're doing in your daily habits will directly impact your cognitive function is also so important 
And I think I'm kind of living proof of, of, of really just not realizing your full potential and not even knowing that you had more in you to give until you sort your lifestyle out and then suddenly things click into place. Suddenly you're having ideas and you're meeting people and you're starting things and you're wanting to be a productive person in society rather than hiding away. That's such a huge thing because confidence uh, through all of this and through feeling better and through your body working the way that it, that it should be or at its kind of like, you know, most positive self, you'll then find all of these things so much easier and it won't be so intimidating to you to put yourself out there. But, you know, creativity especially, it's a, it's a tricky one because it's not, it's not tangible, right? Like it's not something that you can just say, right, be creative. Like I'm, I am in the biggest creative block of my life over the last like two months. I just... I keep telling myself, have I said all there is to be said and have I run out of ideas? I know I haven't, but I'm having one of those creative block months where I'm like, oh, God, what have I got to say? Um, and that's why it's very hard to pinpoint creative creativity and it's hard to force yourself to have ideas. But, you know, fostering creativity, it, it requires time and effort. Uh, people want the booster shot for creativity, but creativity is not something that comes magically. It's a skill. And as with any new skill, the more you practice, the better you get. Uh, so the three factors predicted peak originality, and this is in a study done on teenagers, is openness to experience, intelligence, and importantly, time spent engaging in creative hobbies. That is taking the time to work on creative pursuits to make a difference. Uh, the same is true for adults. Carve out time for yourself, figure out the conditions that are conductive to your creativity and recognize that you need to keep pushing yourself. You won't get where you want to be if you don't try. So this is a big thing. It's that kind of like openness to experience, openness to trying something new, openness to being bad at something the first time you do try it. Like the first time I tried Mai Tai, I was awful, embarrassing, still too embarrassed to go back and try again, but I will because I really want to learn that skill. And that to me feels quite creative. But if we were talking, I suppose more people wouldn't see fitness as creative, painting, writing, poetry, gardening, anything, architecture, whatever it is that you're into. I know you're such a wonderful, uh, well-rounded group of people. I get DMs from people who are like, I'm a surgeon I'm a painter I'm it's so cool to know how many brilliant human beings are tuning into this but you know whatever it is that you love it's about trying and trying and trying failing 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 <laughs> keep pushing yourself but also like allowing yourself to carve out that little bit of time for yourself um and I would argue that you know in order to pursue those creative hobbies, um, sometimes that time has to be taken out of of your exercise time. And that's something I've realized in, in my own race prep for Paris. Um, I've put this podcast and other career stuff before training for this marathon. And I don't regret it at all because that's a huge part of who I am now. And it's something I'm really passionate about. And it's something that makes me feel very creative and like I'm doing good into the world I'm giving myself to the world and it feels very purposeful whereas training for a marathon even though it's great and I love it and it's you know that's the magic it doesn't feel as purposeful for me right now in my life so this has taken precedent and that's fine sometimes in your Venn diagram of time that you have to give to yourself outside of work kids other responsibilities paying bills um, there might just be a wee slice left and if you've got a half that for a hobby that's creative and half it for running or gym, that's fine. Like life doesn't just always have to be about exercise. I think if we circle back to what we were saying in the beginning about, you know, just having those two 60 minutes of aerobic exercise a week, you know, you don't have to exhaust yourself. You also, <laughs> not everyone has to look like a bodybuilder or fitness influencer. That is not the end goal for a lot of people. It's just having a nice life and a body that can fight off colds and a body that is able to have ideas and paint an easel with beautiful colors, you know? So I think keeping all of that in mind is, is also really important as well. Long story short, exercise, it has a huge capacity to enhance learning and good memory function. And 
creativity and all of these things but it, it has to be something that's realistic and adds to your life and sort of takes away from it I think a lot of people get very consumed with exercise and other parts of their life fall off because of it and we have to look at ourselves as well-rounded human beings and what I would never want was for a young person who was viewing fitness online and sees that as the only pursuit of of their life and because when we're like 70 looking back I hope that I'm also able to say I really put time into my I love writing I've really put time into writing that book I wrote a couple of poems I'm really proud of I as you all know I absolutely love poetry um I kept on drawing I didn't lose that after I quit my job in film I kept doing that you know I've got books full of illustrations that I love um, not just that I ran marathons and not just that I stayed slim. Cool. <laughs> Great. Like, you know, there are so much more life affirming things. It's not about losing weight. It's about gaining things. And, um, the older I get, the less importance I'm, I'm really putting on, on physical appearance and like the fitness of physical pursuits. So it, it's an interesting time for sure. So those are, those are some things that I noticed in my fitness journey. The last thing I would say, um, and it's not a big subject, but it's something I've spoken about online a lot is a uh, better posture, balance and strength for everyday tasks. Um, I used to have uh, something called a doage's hump, which is a fat a fat pad on the back of my neck and a forward head placement like this because I was always hunched over looking at my phone um and when you uh, are uh, uh, and this is just scientific so I'm not I don't want to offend anyone but when you do gain a lot of weight quite rapidly sometimes you have fat deposits on your body like I had fat lumps in on my spine and I had them at the top of my neck as well and my posture was awful but the improved posture I have now um, which is something I'm very proud of is how I hold myself is all to do with uh, the strengthening obviously of your posterior chain which is all the back muscles and your leg muscles um, and I just like the idea that you know things like picking up the shopping playing with my cousin playing lifting up cowboy running doing county cross with him just everyday sort of routines and rituals become so much easier because of the body and the life and the resilience that I have built. Um, and all in all, when you put this all together, it just kind of makes a human that's a little bit happier, you know? And I'm, I, I think we all have different forms and we're all doing the best we can with the tools that we have at the time. But what's so lovely about my lifestyle now is that I think I've arrived at a form that would be like, you know, like a warrior like this is me at peak like I could run 50k and throw a spear across a desert and like go and hunt for food and eat my berries and I just think that's really cool to know that within all of us there is that like ancestral warrior like your your ancestors stayed alive so that you are here there are thousands of people in your bloodline that fought so that you arrived you can go to the gym. <laughs> you certainly can. If they can fight off beasts and make it through tooth and nail, no matter where you're from in the world, we all have such rich heritage. Um, but often when I, when I feel like skipping a workout or not eating well or not going for my run, I imagine the whole Celtic bloodline, everything they had to do to get me to where I am now. And then I open the door quite quickly. So that's a good one to think about. So that's it. I hope those are things that helped you. I hope you could take away some information from that that will uh, make you a little bit more motivated to stick to these uh, rituals and routines because really your, your daily routine is 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 what your future is it's what it looks like and I think we get so overwhelmed with the largeness of these journeys and with the sensational challenges we see online you know everyone's running ultras and everyone's looking just incredible and oh it's so fatiguing right oh my gosh I get I am so I am so so fed off of social media at the moment I'm just yeah so if you're feeling like that I'm with you sometimes it's nice to bring it back to just daily habits daily little joys because if you do concentrate on those the time will pass anyway but you'd like it to pass in a positive way so that in a year you can look back and say my goodness didn't that 20 minute 
exercise three times a week changed my life. And I didn't know it would, but 365 days later, here I am. And gosh, that raspberry and yogurt (laughs) instead of Cheerios in the morning, that changed my life a year down the line. Isn't that cool? So I will leave it there, sweet ones. I have a poem to read to you all. Okay, admittedly. (laughs) Usually these are sent in by uh, lovely people. Uh, or they're just from my own cache of uh, of, <laughs> of poems this week because I had a little bit of a tearful half day bed day. We all have them, I think. Um, yeah, just you know when you just you have to be in bed crying. I think we've all had those moments. Um, I think it's very good to just let it out. But sometimes during those cries. Um, even though I've got out of the habit of scrolling, I do have to say sometimes it is nice just to like completely detach from reality and have a little bit of a TikTok. And my TikTok is all obviously running uh, horses and something called Hope Core, which I don't know if you guys know about, but it's basically slideshows of like poems and quotes with like staggeringly harrowing music. And you just swipe through and sob basically which is an amazing thing for a highly sensitive person because it is a really good way of processing emotions so tiktok i'll say you're good for something you're good for hope core but this was something that came up and i thought it was lovely for this so uh this is by carrie fountain uh from a book called burn lake it's not enough to brace yourself eventually you must allow this world to hit you in the face All night I've been getting whiffs of some late blooming honeysuckle. Half of me says, don't breathe, but only half. Love it. Obviously, you know, 2pm in bed with the music playing, it was was really getting me going. Another quote, um, which I loved, and I just wanted to throw it on the end here because it really, really stuck with me because I've been feeling a little bit unsafe in my own routine and future has been a lot of big changes recently. I read this and I was like, I've just got to share that. But the quote is by William G.T. Shedd and it says, a ship is safe in harbour, but that's not what ships are for. (laughs) Oh, that got me going. It's a very Cassia quote, I think. Love you all. Thank you for listening. Can't wait for next week. Thank you for being so wonderful to me. As always, your uh, listenership and love is greatly appreciated. Nine Lives is self-funded and relies on you guys interacting with it. So if you could give me a five-star rating to just help me keep this going, um, that would be amazing. So thank you all. Love you all. Until next week. Goodbye.